Now, in terms of the two different types of so-called Jewish peoples, uh, as I have articulated, the Shefardim are Semitic, and then we have, of course, the Ashkenazi. And the Ashkenazim are descendants from the converted Turkic tribes, the Turks, of the Caucasus Mountains region of the, around the Caspian Sea on the Tartarian Peninsula. And what we have is a situation in which, of course, these Turkic tribes that were north of the Caucasus Mountains were violently converted to the religion of Judaism on a Jewish version of a Christian crusade in a Jewish military conquest of campaign similar or parallel to a Muslim campaign of jihad. And within this Jewish holy war of Holocaust, they converted a violent warrior Turkish tribe known as the Hazar. And this Hazar empire established an empire of slavery in which they uh, enslaved the regional Slavic tribes from whence we inherit the very term slave itself. So the Hazar slave-based empire expanded until point of ultimate collapse, and at the point of its collapse hundreds of years later, after it had surrounded the Caspian Sea with their violent warrior imperial domain, they escaped into Europe and became, of course, the various Ashkenazim which live in the ghettos of Europe, or lived in the ghettos of Europe until the advent of the Theodorite. And, of course, these Jewish people were now assimilated, educated by the Shafardim, into no longer being warrior Turks, but the people of the book. And as such, they were the accountants, they were the bookkeepers, they were willing to touch money, whereas the Christians considered money the root of all evil, and the Christians considered money to be filthy. The Muslims, of course, considered money, uh, especially usury or loan, to be uh, unholy. Uh, this is why there were no banks in Muslim nations for hundreds of years, uh, and for almost a thousand years, there was never any banks in the realm of Dwar al-Islam, or the realm of submission, the realm of Allah and Islam. So the only people who would handle the money between these two superpowers of the Muslims and the Christians, between Christendom and Islam, were the Jews. And of course, they became quite rich off currencies exchange, quite wealthy off of their, uh, e their handling of that money. And these Jewish people became what was considered a massive problem in Europe. Uh, by the time of the uh, First World War, uh, you had many of them, of course, participating in the armies of the Kaiser. These were established middle class uh, Jews, highly educated. Uh, many Jews, of course, in Europe were doctors, lawyers, attorneys. Of course, they could afford the education. So you had a situation in which they were hated for the privileges that they held based on the money that they had. This is why they were hated all over Europe. It's no different from what happens with privileged uh, minorities all over the world. In the case of Asia, it's the overseas Chinese. So most overseas Chinese in Asia, part of the Sinitic or Chinese diaspora, uh, not to be confused with Semitic. This is Sinitic, as in Sino. And that means Sinoviet, like Vietnamese are Sinitic, Chinese are Sinitic. So both of these cultures have a diaspora of overseas Chinese that exist all over Indo-Asia, all over Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, uh, into the Philippines. And they comprise the most educated of all the Asian populations in that region. They dominate the trade, they dominate the legal industry, they dominate the bookkeeping, they dominate uh, dentistry and medical industries because they can afford the education. And the overwhelming majority of them are Christian. So you have here a confluence of ethno-religious identity. They're Sinitic or Chinese and they're Christian. Now these Christians are slaughtered in massive genocidal campaigns by the Indonesians, by the Malaysians, by the Filipinos. Uh, they're murdered uh, ultimately by the millions as has happened in Indonesia in recent recorded history post-World War II, as far as Americans consider World War II, to have actively ended in terms of belligerency. And Americans pay no attention to these people dying who are Christian. As far as all these millions of Chinese Christians dying, my people, I'm a Chinese Christian, Americans care not one whit for them dying because they're not human to Americans, because they're not Jewish. Now, of course, to an American, a Jew is not human either. A Jew is God. 
because to an American, a Jew is a relative of the boss, a relative of God. This is why when you have someone like, say for instance, Roman Polanski, who is a survivor of a German uh, Konzentslagen, or concentration camp, a Roman Polanski comes to the United States, and of course, he date rapes a young girl who, of course, was underage, who continuously said no, uh, almost kills her with an overdose of date rape drug, and, of course, is wanted after that for assault against a minor, uh, escapes to France, escapes extradition, and then comes back to the United States to open a Holocaust Memorial Museum. Now, when he came back to the United States to open a Holocaust Memorial Museum, he was presented with an arrest warrant, and the police were literally chased away by an angry Jewish and Christian crowd, and he was allowed to walk around with his head held high as a child rapist, because he's a Jew, and therefore it's like having God rape your child. So to an American, they will hand over their child, their firstborn son or daughter to a Jew to rape, because Americans think, well, that's a blessing because he or she is being raped by God. So to an American, while millions of Christian Chinese die in Indonesia, an American will say, well, I spit on their graves because they're not human beings. But if a single Jew were to die, or Roman Pulaski gets arrested for raping a girl, an American would throw his own child under the bus to help save Roman Polanski because to him, Roman Polanski is a part of God, a divine manifestation of God because he's a Jew. So this is the insanity of Americans. So this is what the National Socialists were fighting. This is why they were fighting you, because you're antichrist, because you're evil, because you're insane, and because you're a threat to all humanity. And so when the National Socialists ultimately were confronted with what they considered the Jewish question in Europe, they were uh, at the point where they said, we want the Jewish population ultimately deported. Now, this was beginning to happen in a peaceful manner as far as depopulation, deportation, ethnic cleansing can be conducted. Uh, this was happening through two agencies. One was the agency of the Empire of Japan, and uh, what the Japanese had established was a massive region of settlement in Manchuria. Directly on the Manchurian border between Russia and China today is the autonomous oblast of Birobijan, which is known as the Jewish Autonomous Oblast in the Soviet Union, and now, of course, still maintains as such under Vladimir Putin's Russia. And this is where many Shefardim, who were ethnically Semitic, uh, went to establish a new Israel, a new Zion, because they were no longer wanted in Europe, they were no longer wanted in Southwest Asia, what Americans know as the Middle East, and these were known as Baghdadi Jews, or Iraqi Jews. And these Shefardim Baghdadi Jews were led in this massive exodus with the financial aid of Mr. Sassoon, who was, of course, one of the founders of the Vidal Sassoon Cosmetics Dynasty. And the Sassoons helped millions, uh, literally uh, what amounted to almost a million, uh, ultimately one million Jews, resettle in Japan and through the Japanese Empire into the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, as it's recognized by the Russians today, that is a buffer state between communist China and the Russian Federation. It's still there on the map. If you look up the Jewish Autonomous Oblast that was originated and established by the Japanese through a series of Japano-Soviet wars. These Japano-Soviet wars were three in a row. They took place three years in a row, like an annual tournament involving hundreds of thousands of men, machines, armor, uh, air power, artillery. Tens of thousands of men died. Uh, in the end, the Japanese must have suffered well over uh, 200,000 fatalities, uh, probably uh, half a million casualties, combating the Soviet Union in 1937, 1938, 1939, uh, to establish this Jewish Autonomous Oblast. Now, thanks to Sassoon and the Japanese, they were able to create a homeland for a million Jews where the national language was Yiddish. Now, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, many of them left the, uh, that particular territory for Israel and warmer climates. There are barely 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people there today speaking the Yiddish language. Uh, it's obviously a frontier territory. 
very much a what you would call a rough tourism uh, camping mostly hotels that may not have hot and cold running water and the like but it's an area which undeniably and historically was the first Israel so with that first Israel established that is one of the top secrets of the state of Israel as uh, it's known uh, that occupies Palestine because they don't want everybody in the world asking well since that was established first why don't you all move there and leave the Palestinians alone since there's nobody there to displace or to bother or to kill well of course it's a Siberian environment <laughs> it's not very conducive to comfortable living so none of the Jews want to move there so you're stuck with them in terms of their wanting to live someplace in Palestine. But how did they get there? They got there through the help of Adolf Hitler. Now, Adolf Hitler, of course, was uh, presented with the fact that he did not personally want to kill all Jews. He was a person whose story has been misrepresented, just like it was misrepresented by the lunatic who wrote the book The Pink Swastika. His story was represent misrepresented by a Satanist called Peter Lavinda. Peter Lavinda is, of course, a satanic acolyte of the Temple of Set of Michael Aquino. And Peter Lavinda wrote a book called Unholy Alliance, in which he conflated National Socialism with Satanism. And there's only one place in the world where that peculiar conflation has taken place. That's the United States with the domestic neo-Nazi movement through people like Boyd Rice, through people like uh, originally far-right uh, idealists, like uh, Magus Anton Zandor LeVay, who was ethnically Jewish and derived his philosophy of humanistic Satanism from Ayn Rand, who was also ethnically Jewish. So you have Ayn Rand creating an atheistic capitalism to counter atheistic Marxism, which was a creation of a Jewish intellectual. And Ayn Rand was also a Jewish intellectual in exile. Karl Marx was in exile in London from Germany. He was known as the Red Prussian. Ayn Rand was, of course, a Russian Jew who was in exile from communist Russia. So she was in America establishing an atheistic capitalism. And ultimately, this atheistic capitalism became the foundation for ideological Satanism under Magus Anton Zandor LaVey. So these are far-right Jews and Satanists who ultimately, uh, Ayn Rand being an atheist, uh, of course, Anton Zandor LaVey being a Satanist, who ultimately became inspirations for people who considered themselves Nordic Aryan and of the Merovingian bloodline, like Boyd Rice. And they brought you this bizarre conflation of American neo-Nazi Satanism. That is a homegrown domestic American perversion, and it has absolutely nothing to do with European national socialism or the global ideology of national socialism. Now, under the experience of Adolf Hitler, of course, he was a man whose mother was kept alive for many months uh, during her transition by a Jewish uh, doctor who uh, was Dr. Bloch. The Americans wrote a long article about him even during the Second World War where they named him Hitler's favorite Jew. And uh, this doctor was provided uh, SS escort, uh, Schutzstaffel uh, escort. Uh, his family was under protection. No one was allowed to disturb him. And ultimately, uh, he left Germany quite voluntarily, not because he was exiled by Adolf Hitler, because Adolf Hitler did not want him injured during the American bombing campaigns. So when he left to the United States, the Americans called him Hitler's favorite Jew. And uh, Peter Lavinda rewrote history and fictionalized it and said, oh, this is why Hitler wanted to kill the Jews, because his mother died under the care of this Jewish doctor. All of this was a lie just as much as the story that Adolf Hitler was homosexual was a lie. And this is all done in your constant, perverse, literally satanic propaganda campaign against Adolf Hitler, the Third Reich, and National Socialism. Now, Adolf Hitler, with these positive experiences with Jews behind him, was trying his best to expedite Jewish removal out of Germany, out of Europe, and he did so with the Havara Agreement. Where Havara is a Hebrew word that transliterates as moving house. It was known as the transfer agreement. It was written about most analytically and probably most comprehensively so far in history by a man named Edward Black, who was Jewish. And Black is a surname. He created that surname 
uh, out of fear for his life, because when he exposed the details of the transfer agreement, uh, many Jews and Israelis threatened to kill him and kill members of his family. So to protect them and himself, he changed his name to Black as the author. Under that name, you can find his book, The Transfer Agreement. Now, the transfer agreement speaks in great detail about how Adolf Hitler, in a time of great financial desperation, when he was uh, basically trying to pull Germany out of the Depression and needed every dollar, every Reichsmark, uh, to be maintained within the territory of the Reich, uh, to revitalize its economy, he allowed Jews to leave for Palestine and take their money with them. Now, that's a fact, and all of these Jews took advantage of this offer by the tens of thousands. Ultimately, well over 100,000 Jews, more, many more, hundreds of thousands, transferred to Palestine from Germany, and because of that, Adolf Hitler is the founder of the state of Israel. And that's one of the reasons they killed Adolf Eichmann, because Adolf Eichmann was a national socialist who spoke perfect Hebrew. He was one of the men who taught Jews to speak Hebrew. Most Jews never spoke Hebrew. Jews spoke German. And because all of the Jews who were living in Germany didn't want to leave Germany because they were all doctors and lawyers and, and heavily invested in German economy and the way of life, uh, were perfectly happy to be in Germany. Uh, nobody wanted to move to a strip of land that not even the, uh, the, not even the lizards wanted, a spit of desert uh, called Palestine. Uh, the only people who were willing to leave were a bunch of political zealots that were called Zionists. And these Zionists became very cooperative with, of course, the SS, because they were the only Jews who wanted to leave Germany. The SS taught them agriculture, and of course, it was geniuses of military tactics, such as Rommel and Guderian, that taught them how to fight in armored mechanized columns that they later on used in their wars against the Arabs. So when you have all of this that comes out of Germany, this is why in 1945, when uh, Adolf Hitler had his 56th birthday or so, uh, what happened was Heinrich Himmler uh, honored him at his birthday in the Führer Bunker and immediately thereafter went to meet the head of the Jewish World Congress in Germany. And the head of the Jewish World Congress flew, this is historically vetable, people can look this up, it's undeniable, the head of the Jewish World Congress flew into Germany in the midst of bombing campaigns, in the midst of an approaching Soviet army. He went in to meet the head of the Schutzstaffel, Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler, to plot the escape of Heinrich Himmler and, and Adolf Hitler. And that's because Israel owed Hitler and Himmler and all the National Socialists so much that they owed them their escape and were predominantly helpful in masterminding the escape of the National Socialist East High Command from out of the Thaled Reich at the time of its collapse. Now, in terms of that individual who was in charge of the Jewish World Congress, he wrote a book about this. He actually wrote a book, oh, I met with Heinrich Himmler, and he said, oh, I saved 20,000 Jews as a result of this. Heinrich Himmler turned them over. Now, ask yourself this question, of course. At that point in history, with approaching Soviets, uh, and Americans, of course, threatening uh, to bomb Berlin with an atomic bomb. That was, of course, known as an actual threat at that time, an actual projected threat. Why on earth would Heinrich Himmler say, oh, man, i got to meet with this Jew and turn over a couple of thousand Jews to this guy because I just can't exit this world without doing that. Uh, obviously, arrangements were being made, exchanges were being made, uh, and, of course, the ultimate result was the spiriting out of Adolf Hitler and the Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler and other members of the National Socialist East High Command. Now, in between all of this context, what was going on that led to what we term the Holocaust? We have, of course, the Judaic declaration of war by the diaspora against the Third Reich, forcing Adolf Hitler to declare a state of emergency. It's very important to remember that Adolf Hitler was democratically elected. He was democratically elected into a coalition government with the conservatives. His title was Kanzler. People can look this up historically. His title was Kanzler of Germany. That meant he was the Chancellor of a democratic Germany. So when Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany, he was the Chancellor of a democracy in which he was in a coalition government with the conservatives. Now, when Judea declared war against Germany and sanctions were uh, instated by the British Empire and the United States, at that point, 
Adolf Hitler had to declare a state of emergency. And at that point, he became Reichskanzler. He became the Chancellor of the realm of a dictatorship in a state of emergency because at that point the Reich was in a state of war. So at that point, in a state of war, he deals with other crises that come up, such as Herschel Grinspan. Herschel Grinspan's surname is bastardized into the name Greenspan, like Ron Greenspan. And Herschel Grinspan was a beautiful, charismatic, young Jewish boy who had a sexual relationship with a Prussian officer who was a member of the Sturmabdelung, or the Stormtrooper units, who, which was a self-defense unit created by the homosexual community in Germany to protect themselves from homophobes and homophobic attacks. And the brown shirts were, of course, not uh, just bottom men. They weren't gays who were going to stand, uh, lie down, and take it. These were men who were going to fight back. And they organized themselves in old Africa Corps uniforms from the First World War, from the German East Africa Corps, or the Schutztrupp. And that's why all their uniforms were brown, hence the name brown shirts. These were old World War I Africa surplus uniforms. They would don those, and then they became so politically active and effective, they allied with Adolf Hitler, or rather Adolf Hitler allied with them, and they became a large part of the vanguard of National Socialism in the establishment of the Failed Reich. Now, one of these officers became a diplomat to France, and this young Jewish boy who he had a relationship with walked into his diplomatic offices in Paris and killed him, assassinated him. This led, of course, to Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, and the German retaliation uh, with the raiding of Jewish shops, the destruction of Jewish businesses, the arrest of uh, tens of thousands of uh, predominantly Jewish young men, uh, the relocation to work camps or labor camps. And this, of course, was the beginning of what we know as Konzertslagen, or concentration camps. Now, it's very important to know that no one ever punished Herschel Grinspan. He was taken to one of these camps in a very specially protected area where he was given special status, kind of like the man in the iron yarmulke, and no one could touch him. And even Adolf Eichmann, when he was interrogated in Israel, uh, stated when questioned about Herschel Grinspan, he said, I don't know what became of him. He said, I actually wanted to speak to him myself. Uh, he had an enormous charisma, like a tremendous magnetic sway, and yet no one knew what happened to him. And somewhere, photographs began to emerge of him in 1946, where he was still alive, and he apparently survived the war, and uh, no one knew what became of him. So you have this very influential figure in the history of the Failed Reich. There's a book that's out about him called The Boy Who Started World War II. While that might take it too far, the one thing we cannot deny is that Herschel Grinspan is the boy who started the Holocaust. So with the advent of Kristallnacht and the uh, internment of many Jews into Konzenslagen or uh, concentration camps, which are not death camps, we have the advent of the death camps or Totenslagen only with the advent of American firebombing and British firebombing. When it came to the turning of Dresden and major German cities into open air infernos, firestorms, burning with the heat of the surface of the sun, when people were dying in incinerators, burning alive in open air ovens. Then at that point, Adolf Hitler and the National Socialist High Command turned to Reinhard Heydrich, and Reinhard Heydrich of the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, or the Schutzstaffel Intelligence, the SS uh, Intelligence Division, organized the Heydrich camps. These were the Totenslagen, or the death camps. Now, at that point in history, we also had the massive invasion of the Soviet Union ongoing, and many nations were being liberated, not just from communism, but by their own cognizance from the Jew. In places like Romania, in places like Ukraine, what is correctly spoken of as Ukraina, we had the massive massacre at Babi Yar. Babi Yar was where Jews, of course, were forced to dig mass graves, and the Einsatzgruppen, or the action units, 
would kill them until they could no longer hold their arms up to fire, at which point they would turn their guns on other Jews and force them to kill the Jews themselves until they themselves could no longer fire, at which point they went into the pits with the mass graves with the other Jews. All of these Jews were assembled by the Ukrainian people who said, kill them, kill them, because they had run the economy for centuries. They were all the doctors, they were all the lawyers, they were all the privileged. None of their children could ever afford to get an education. None of their children could even learn to read or write. But all of the Jews who lorded over them like feudal lords, they want it dead, because all these same Jews were Bolshevik commissars when the Soviets took over. So everyone in Ukraine where you had the massive genocide was cooperating to kill the Jews as opposed to the Theod Reich. It was a popular uprising against Jewish plutocracy. And in terms of Poland, it was the same way. Poland is one of the most Judeophobic nations on earth today. Everything is Jew this, Jew that. And you honestly wonder why, because there's no Jews left in Poland, because of course, the Poles killed them all. Oh, of course, properly they're referred to as Polaki. To call a Polish person a Pole is like calling a person from Holland a whole. But the Polaki peoples were the people who made the death camps run in Poland. They brought the Jews over to the Third Reich. The Third Reich could never have hunted down all of these Jews and collected them without a single crucial factor popular support. So all the people turned in all their Jews and said, by God, take them, kill them, kill them, <laughs> please kill them. And the majority of them died in Poland. So if you want to see who's responsible for the Holocaust, turn to Poland. Those are the true villains. But where all of these death camps of Operation Heydrich were in the majority outside of Germany. The overwhelming majority of Germans had no knowledge of them. And these, this was indeed a covert operation. Now, what was the purpose of it? Because during this period of war, when ideologically many people had come to the conclusion because the Jews were so much a part of the establishment of Bolshevism, because they were so much of a part of the establishment of the original uh, sanctions by the Anglo-Americans, to them, the Anglo-American Soviet alliance was a Jewish alliance. So to wage war against the enemy was to wage war against the Jew. That was the whole reason for the conquest of the East, the genocide of all of European Jewry within the European Pale of Settlement, the Jewish empire that stretched from the North Sea to the Black Sea. All of that belt of Jewish dominance was eradicated. Adolf Hitler wanted them all to go to the Japanese sanctuary that was known later in the Russian as Birobijan, named after its capital, the Jewish Autonomous Oblast. And uh, he would gladly have shipped them all there into a Yiddish-speaking nation, but they all wanted Palestine. So they said, with blackmail and with terrorism, you give us Palestine or we'll push for more sanctions and the Reich will collapse economically. So Adolf Hitler was blackmailed into becoming the father of the state of Israel. So that is to conceptualize and conclude the stance of this war as it stands. And do I advocate, of course, the genocide of Jews in Israel or elsewhere? Of course not. That's not the case at all. That was a different time and a different place. And this does not justify even what happened then, but it contextualizes it. So with the historian's duty, obligation, responsibility of reality, factuality, and contextualization, this is the context in which Americans need to see the accomplishment of the Reich. Whether they condemn it or whether they uphold it or whether they simply observe it, the reality of the Reich was that the Holocaust was real and it was the objective of the Second World War. Then you have to acknowledge the reality of the Holocaust, see the context in which it took place, and then you are finally at an understanding of history and why we've come to where we're at. And that should be, I think, uh, context enough for now. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Excellent. Oh, thank that, you. that was just great. Oh. Uh, one question I'd like to ask you here, sure. um, <clears throat> particularly since we've covered the Jewish issue quite extensively here, uh, the circumcision of 80% of the United States and 80% of Israel is circumcised. 
Do you uh, draw any conclusions from that relationship, or do you see anything in that that uh, that we? that we should be interested in? Oh, of course, yes. No one in Asia gets circumcised. Nobody in the continent of Europe was circumcised other than a Jew. But in America, everyone is circumcised because they worship the Jew. That is all part of that. See, they'll turn their son over and they'll say, oh, for God's sakes, leave your mark on him. That's like you're leaving him with God's blessing. That's the mark of the beast. And they say, oh, give me that. I want it. You know, oh, you know, they would give you their son's life if they could. They would have you circumcise their daughters uh, with a clitoridectomy if the Jews asked for it. They, they would, oh, they, the, the Americans will give anything to a Jew. They will give their lives, their children, uh, all their money. This is, this is what the Americans worship. The, the Americans deserve everything they get, of course. Now, it's always important to remember that all of your military, Department of Defense, 100,000 bureaucrats, all of your armed forces, Coast Guard, Army, Navy, Marines, all your National Guard, all your reserves, everything put together is less than 1% of the American population. Less than 1%. So that is a cult. It is effectively a cult that is smaller than some active cults today across the globe. And yet these people, of course, get over half of your discretionary fiscal income every single year because they hold your entire nation under terror through the pedophocracy which is why, of course, they tried to allude to that with Pizzagate, and that was entirely political. Through Pizzagate, of course, they wanted the advent of Donald Trump, and since Donald Trump won the electoral vote but lost the popular vote, the electoral vote could easily have turned against him with the Electoral College voting any way they wanted. So while the Electoral College was making that decision to vote, they came out with Pizzagate. It was an FBI agent turned whistleblower and point out the fact these are the enemy, these are the people who terrorize you, they gang stalk you, they arrest you. This is the American KGB. Anyone who feels the FBI is their friend is a fool. And some FBI agent comes along and says, oh man, I'm going to deputize the internet. You know, uh, Michelle uh, Carmela Saldana is descript descriptive for it, which I think is, is apropos. And he deputized the inter internet, which is a lynch mob and just turns the lynch mob loose, says Pizzagate, Pizzagate, you know, and gets everybody stomping up and down and didn't it about potential Hillary Clinton connection with, of course, pedophilia. And, of course, it's all run out of comet ping pong and it goes to the point where somebody finally goes crazy and some 28-year-old guy with a firearm goes into comet ping pong pizza parlor and shoots it up, literally unloads a firearm, empties a clip, and miraculously no one dies. Now, this head case is rightfully in custody and hopefully spends the rest of his life institutionalized or in prison. Uh, and of course, everything kind of calms down. Why? Because now Trump is president. The Electoral College during that period of time realized, oh man, if we make Hillary president and vote for her, they're gonna kill us. They're gonna say we're all a bunch of pedophiles. They're gonna say I eat a comic came ping pong pizza and pick up on the kids. So they were under blackmail and duress, pressured to vote Donald Trump. So they brought in Donald Trump now. So the powers that be, the FBI at least, wanted Donald Trump for president. Now, Donald Trump represents crisis and opportunity. Uh, a cl hackneyed cliche is the Chinese iconograph for crisis, which is also used for opportunity. Uh, and this particular Chinese character is the attitude with which we have to take Donald Trump because he is a crisis, which hopefully we find opportune as a individuals or as a population. Uh, but he is definitely uh, a crisis. <laughs> this is, uh, he's a unknown uh, and uh, he uh, behaves quite irrationally. And uh, therefore, we don't know what direction we're going in under Donald Trump or what's going to happen. And we can only make our, uh, do what we, uh, we can only make our best. Uh, he wants to set the clock back 50 years. He wants to uh, lock himself in goose step with Israel. Uh, he wants to, of course, uh, make Russia a friend. Now, all of this is very intriguing because when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, the big thing back in the day from all of the Jew worshippers, like Pat Boone, was to start all of these uh, fund drives to bring a Jewish family into the United States, help a Jewish family escape the former Soviet Union, bring them into the United States. And so Pat Boone and all these Jew worshippers were bringing in tens of thousands of Jews to the United States. And what happened was they broke the welfare system. 
Every single one of them got on welfare. Every single one of them raided all of the civil storage facilities in the advent of uh, nuclear attack or uh, environmental emergency. Uh, so when Katrina went down, there was no stores for Katrina of medical supplies, food, or anything in all of the warehouses that was supposed to house all this because all the Russian Jews had already raided it and taken everything. So when the Russian Jews were denuding America of everything, I mean, literally, they would go inside of, of these places and just take everything. And they were, of course, because the Americans worshiped them as God, they let them have everything. They said they gave them carte blanche. You can take it all, take it all. And they just took it all. They took everything. Uh, America finally realized, well, we can't afford this because they're going to start taking everything else. So they demanded to Israel, you've got to start taking these people. And they said, we can't take them anymore. We're not going to take them anymore. So you've got to start taking them. So when Papoon and the Jew worshippers kept funneling these people out, they all suddenly had to start going to Israel, which none wanted to do because Israel has suffrage. It's got mandatory service in the military. So none of them want to serve in the military. None of them want to do their time on the front lines with the Intifada or the Palestinians. None of them want to be deployed. So all of them were coming to America where they could live fat, and then they had to go to Israel, the rest of them where they could live skinny. Well, since that time, one-third of the population of Israel is Russian. And people don't realize that now. The Umgensprache, the language of choice, the common spoken language in Israel is Russian. It is not Hebrew now. One-third of the population speaks Russian, and they're the swing vote. Whoever gets the Russian vote wins Israel. So all of the Likud, the various other parties, they all jockey for who can influence the Russians for who they're going to vote for in Israel. So they're a Russian satellite state. And that's why Trump says, no more enemies with Russia. Because, of course, the big connection between Russia is all of these Russian girls that are addicted to heroin by the Jewish mafia that are shipped to Israel and used as sex slaves. They're taken to the flesh pots of Tel Aviv, Yefa, various other uh, places in Israel, where, of course, uh, Arabs, uh, various people of all nationalities go to Israel on these sex tours and they have sex with these women, basically rape them multiple times a day, uh, where these women, of course, are get paid in nothing but their heroin dose until they die. Uh, that's what Israel serves to the world right now. It doesn't sell them oranges. It's not selling them, uh, besides sex, it sells weapons. But other than that, it sells Russian hookers. So all the money that's made off of all these Russian women shipped to Israel is the big connection with a gangster plutocrat like Vladimir Putin. Now, Vladimir Putin is the second wealthiest man in the world next to Bill Gates. And he's outlawed Microsoft because he hates Bill Gates because Bill Gates is richer than him. So Microsoft is outlawed in Russia. And of course, uh, Vladimir Putin kills journalists. Anyone who speaks against him, he outlaws memes. Memes, of course, are the way people post messages on Facebook. They're outlawed in Russia. Use a meme, go to jail. But Americans want to live like that. Because Americans say, oh, we love Vladimir Putin because he's the great white hope. So they say, we love Donald Trump because he's Vladimir Putin's butt boy. And Vladimir Putin sponsored so much of Trump's campaign. That's why Trump isn't going to take the salary of the president in the White House. Trump is going to be the first president to ever enter the White House. And he says, I refuse the presidential salary. And he's refusing the presidential salary because if he took that salary, he'd have to expose his tax returns. And it would turn out all his sponsorship comes from Vladimir Putin. And that would expose him for what he is as just a Russian butt boy. So that's what the Americans want. They want to live in a place where memes are outlawed. They want to live in a place where journalists are killed. They want to live in a place like Russia. So I invite all you white Americans, move to Russia. See what it's like there where you can't post a meme where journalists are killed, and where you get sent to Siberia. Because in the former Soviet Union, as inefficient as it was, as corrupt as it was, they at least had bread lines. They had to redistribute. They had to distribute something. It might take days to get to you. You might never get it. You would stand in line for it. All of it is of inferior quality. None of that is there anymore. Because Vladimir Putin isn't sharing his wealth. He's keeping it all to himself. And so you want that? You can have it. They want Trump because that's what he represents to them. A Vladimir Putin wants to keep his wealth to himself, and we'll see how far it goes, what trouble he's going to start. Uh, because he's going to take Russia off the threat list, 
and we'll see what threats he generates because he wants to revivify the military, wants to make the military great again. So he surrounded himself with all these living fossils from the Cold War, yet Russia's not the enemy. So all these living fossils from the Cold War, all these old generals, like World War II, when World War II started, every general in the high command had one thing in common. They were older than Moses. They were older than dirt. These were all survivors of the Spanish-American War. And all these guys were running World War II to the ground. And now all this same type of senile old F, whose heyday was the day of the B-52 bomber, whose day, heyday was the day when all those bombers crashed over Hanoi and was the biggest defeat in American history. The entire Strategic Air Command crashed over Hanoi. Uh, and and uh, when you had that happen, uh, America's Air Force was so defeated, they said, oh, we're not going to do bombers anymore. We're going to go underground, do ICBMs. That's when all that started. And that's what Trump said, oh, we're going to build more nukes. We're going to build more nukes. Well, well, what for, for what? Well, because these old guys want their big bang before they die. They want to go out with a bang. They want to go out with a nice big nuclear orgasm and a nice big phallic mushroom cloud, their last direction. So they're all getting together with that 70-year-old guy, Trump, and they're saying, we're going to deliver the Viagra. We're going to, one last time, we're going to set it off. And that's what the Americans want, only it's not against the Russians because they're white. So I say, all you Americans, move to Russia, all you whites, before you blow up the rest of the world, before you set off that nuke someplace, all you whites, move to Russia and live in Siberia, especially all you militia men who look like a bunch of queer bears anyway, with all your bellies hanging out and your beards hanging low. Why don't you go saddle up on some bears over there in Russia and Siberia and uh, just ride yourself until you feel better? Because that's all you're going to have, because out in Russia you won't be able to afford nothing else. And of course, that is where America stands. And uh, that's how Trump became president. But Americans associate him with Christ. So when I'm online, and I expose what I expose on YouTube. Oh, Americans write in and they say that. Oh, how could you have somebody like Douglas Dietrich speaking? He's from San Francisco. He's a faggot that both Christ and Trump condemn. I said, oh, wow, they're equating Christ and Trump, just like they equate the Jew with God. So this is where Americans are at. But of course, all Americans didn't want this. The majority of Americans didn't want this. You had a flawed electoral college system set up by extraordinarily evil people called the Founding Fathers. And of course there were Americans hundreds of years before there were the Founding Fathers. There were Americans who were Puritans who lived under a theocracy. They lived by the law of the Bible. Now all of these Puritans, Quakers and Shakers, all of them in America had their faults and they were genocidal and they were a bunch of religious fanatics, and I'm certain that they wouldn't be considered liberal progressive by any standard, no doubt homophobic, racist, everything you can imagine, but they lived by the Bible. And suddenly, the Founding Fathers came along, and just as there were Russians hundreds of years before there was a constitutional republic known as the Soviet Union, suddenly the Russians all found themselves under a collective. The word Soviet in the Russian simply means collective. They were under a collective union and no longer could they call themselves Russian because they had to identify with all these other ethnic nationalities, Kazakhstanis, Azerbaijanis, the Azeris and the Kazakhs, these various uh, Asiatic and Caucasian people from other parts like a Canada with 14 Quebecs and beyond. All of these people had to call themselves Soviet, no longer Russian, because they had to be kissing brothers with the Ukraines, the Belarus, the white Russians, the little Russians, uh, all of these other nationalities, and that's where the term Soviet came into effect. All of that's gone to hell in a handbasket now, and rightly so, and the Russians still survive. That's why Vladimir Putin says, we're not Soviet, we're Russian. So all the Russians have survived the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the Americans will survive the collapse of the United States. Now, the United States was started by a bunch of criminals who called themselves the Founding Fathers. And uh, they used this Declaration of Independence. And of course, in Chinese, there is no word for independence. The closest concept we have in a character or an iconograph is that which portrays a criminal mindset that if transliterated, roughly transliterates as every man for himself. 
So when the Declaration of Independence is translated into Chinese, it literally reads as a criminal covenant, a criminal contract in which a bunch of criminals got together and said, we all agree, every man for himself. And that pretty much describes America. So these founding fathers, what were they? Rapists, perverts, mass murderers, serial killers. George Washington, of course, was a war criminal. He was a traitor to the crown. They were all traitors. And they were all traitors because the civilized King George said, thus far and no farther, he drew a line in the dirt and said, no more beyond the Appalachian Mountains. You're a maritime republic. You stay here under the crown as a maritime colonial uh, collection of various colonies. And if you want to trade with the Indians, you go through the French because the French have the middle of the United States and they intermarry with the Indians. They've been trading with them for uh, decades and you can get all your goods from them. And the American founding fathers said, no, we want it all. We want it sea to shining sea. So they went to war, the longest declared war in American history until World War II, eight years long from 1775 on up until the point of its bloody conclusion, the Vietnam War of its time. And when they finally concluded that horrific war of eight years, all of the peons, the slaves, uh, to the feudal lords known as the founding fathers, the white guys who were farmers, had to give up their farms, give up their families so they could go fight, and they never got paid. And that's where the commissioned and non-commissioned officer class came in. A commissioned officer in the United States has stock in the nation. He has to fight even if he's not paid. He has to go down with the ship. He has stock in the ship of state. A non-commissioned officer, from a private all the way up to a master sergeant, as opposed to a commissioned officer, which would be a lowly lieutenant all the way up to a general. Uh, a non-commissioned officer, if you don't get paid, you don't have to fight. That's per uniform code of military justice. And the United States keeps not paying its soldiers, keeps neglecting to pay them. They never paid the soldiers of the Revolutionary War. So all these veterans of the American War of Independence pointed all their muskets at uh, Thomas Jefferson, at Alexander Hamilton, and they said, we want our pay. And all of the founding fathers escaped. They ran away to this piece of swamp that they turned into a sewer called Washington, D.C. They ran out of Philadelphia where all the veterans were trying to kill them. And then when they captured all the veterans, they rounded them up and had them all executed and hanged. This was a veterans rebellion, very similar to the popular rebellions like Shays' Rebellion. It's historical fact. And then when they created Washington District of Columbia, they said, we'll make certain passe comitatus doesn't apply here, so we can kill anybody who comes to us here from now on. Common law does not apply. So that's why when the veterans who didn't get paid for World War I went on the bonus march to Washington, D.C. and camped outside of the White House, President Hoover called in General Douglas MacArthur, General George Patton, and General Dwight Eisenhower, and he had them kill the veterans. All these three, Eisenhower and MacArthur and Patton, got together and ordered all their troops, kill all the World War I veterans who fought for us in World War I, who fought under our command in World War I, because they want their money, and we're not going to pay them. So they cut loose on the veterans with poison gas, left over from World War I, opened machine guns, cavalry charges. They killed women. They killed children. And, of course, that was because they could do so, because Washington, D.C., and they can kill you whenever they want because no posse comitatus holds there, because they learned their lesson from Philadelphia. And all these founding fathers were uh, people like George Washington, who massacred entire Indian villages. He was known as the village burner in the Mohawk language, because he would have his Marin surround entire villages when all the braves were out hunting. And he'd set them on fire. And then when the woman, the children, infants in their arms, elderly on walking sticks came running out, his men would bayonet them to death. And if they wanted to waste the ammunition, they'd shoot them and put them out of their misery. There was one campaign alone in which he killed hundreds of thousands like this. That's George Washington. That's what your capital is named after. And he's on your $1 bill, which is a piece of toilet paper. And you've got Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin used to take his black slaves, saw them apart until they died while they were alive, saw them back up together again, and try and reanimate them with electricity. He was the... Uh, inspiration for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein's doctor. And of course they'll say, oh, he's got all these black bones in his basement over there in Britain. And they don't tell you about the ones he had in the United States. And they'll say, oh, that's because his gay boyfriend was a uh, anatomist and he had to study anatomy. So he needed a lot of black bodies so he could study anatomy. That's why they're all sawed apart and stitched back together again. But no, Benjamin Franklin was a serial killer. 
and he used to electrocute these bodies, all these black bodies, just to watch them twitch. And this guy is on your $100 bill, which makes it a piece of toilet paper. Oh, then you got Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson used to screw all his black slaves. And of course, uh, all the whites will tell you, oh, he was doing them a favor. Yeah, he was giving them more half yellow kids. And then of course he'd screw those kids. He was saying he was making them whiter. He said it was a genetic experiment. And so Thomas Jefferson, this scumbag, that's the moral equivalent of child molestation or bestiality because a slave has no will. A slave is an ambulatory piece of equipment. A slave is like an animal that's harnessed. A slave is not a human being by legal definition, so it can't say no. So if you're having sex with something that can't say no, that's the moral equivalent of bestialism or child rape. And all his friends said, oh, it's cool. He's just eccentric. Great men need to be allowed their eccentricities. That to them was the equivalent of one of their buddies going out and screwing the cattle out in the field, screwing a horse, and, uh, or screwing with the ducks, pigs, and chickens in the hen house. And everybody said, oh, that's great. He's all right. And you know, he was seeing how white he could make him, which is how we came up with these terms like octoroon, one-eighth white. Thanks to Thomas Jefferson, this guy's on your $20 bill. I mean, this guy makes William Jefferson Clinton look like a choir boy. <laughs> and, uh, and all these guys were your founding fathers. And what did they create? They created the Electoral College. They said, well, we're going to take all North America. And when we take all North America, we're going to have people out there living in these states who are going to be like one person every few hundred miles. And, you know, if they vote, it's going to be meaningless. Uh, only the people in the cities will have a vote that counts, so how do we handle this? Oh, we'll create this electoral college. That way they don't have taxation without representation, which is what we told them we started this war about. So the electoral college gave all these people out in nowhere land, where they killed all the Indians, but no whites really settled, because there's nothing to eat, and there's nothing to grow, you know, anything on other than dirt. <laughs> and all these people live in the, the Dakotas, in Wyoming, uh, Montana, these empty states where there's nothing but mountains and Mormons and missile silos. All these people need the Electoral College. And all these states are white. So what got Trump into the presidency? The white vote in these white states where all the Indians were killed off and no blacks want to live because most blacks don't want to live like Grizzly Adams. And so all these whites living out there brought us Donald Trump, the orange president, like Tang. And they say, oh, we want him. He represents us. And he's colored, too, because he's colored like tape. And so now we've got Trump, thanks to these people. So it's a militia junta. We've got a coup d'etat by the American constitutional fundamentalists and the militia movement. And we've been brought this president. And we're going to see what happens with this. This is the insanity of what we have. And the Americans deserve everything they get. And of course, we have to remember, he got 25% of the vote. Now we could swing that back to Clinton. William Jefferson Clinton never won the vote. If William Jefferson Clinton had been running in a normal campaign, he would have lost the first time and you never would have heard of him. Uh, but what had happened was Ross Perot, the proto-Trump. And Ross Perot took all the Trump vote from George Bush Sr. And then with the second election, Ross Perot took all the Trump vote from Robert Dole. And both times you were given Clinton by default because if you had put the Trump vote, the Ross Perot vote together with Senator Bob Dole or George Bush Sr., they would have won the election by a landslide. But because this right-wing reactionary businessman, the proto-Trump, Ross Perot stole all the votes from what otherwise would have been a Republican landslide, Clinton won both times by default by a very minority, about 25%, just like we had the victory of Donald Trump. There's a difference. When William Jefferson Clinton became president, the Japanese had a huge investment in the United States and were reconstructing its industry because they had won the war and they were opening up uh, to reconstruct American industry for the poor Americans who they felt so bad for. They were opening up automobile plants in the Deep South and Dixie. They were opening up uh, various industries which were employing Americans. And because of that, Americans had a surplus. So when President Clinton became president, it didn't matter that he didn't win the popular vote. People tolerated it because we had a surplus. But now Trump has won under the same conditions where he won by 25% of the vote. Hillary Clinton won another 
and the other 50% didn't vote. So he's got 75% of the public that he does not represent. And there's no surplus. <laughs> there's no surplus. And Japan still owns the majority of American debt. Not China, but Japan. Japan owns 80% of the debt. And China owns, uh, or 70%. China owns 20%. And South Korea owns 10%. So all this debt owed Asia, and what does Trump want to do? Let's break up all our trade agreements so Americans can't get affordable products from China anymore. And he claims he's going to build up industry in the United States. And uh, so he's thinking on 19th century terms. And we're in the 20th century now where everything's electronic, uh, where we've got automation up the ass, and he's telling people to go out and pick up a jackhammer and start jacking the streets. And this is the insanity that we have in terms of the situation we've got. And uh, where it will go, nobody knows. And you might say, well, Douglas Dietrich, he was starting with communist China. Isn't that good for Taiwan? Well, no, <laughs> because Taiwan, of course, the Nationalist Republic of China is reestablished on Taiwan. The overwhelming majority of people want the status quo. They're quite happy with the way things are. They've got the highest quality of life in the world. They don't want war with communist China. They, uh, if anything, younger Taiwanese are looking for recognition as a nation state of Taiwan, which I, of course, don't recommend. I'm not part of that younger generation. I don't think in those terms. But what Donald Trump is bringing us is something that could be the end of everything everybody has. So we'll see what happens. Uh, this might be a great opportunity for all of us. And uh, if war starts in China, uh, then all I can say to Americans is, if you want to get rid of me, give me carte blanche. Give me $200 million to start with. Give me carte blanche. You can send me over to China, and I can help try and stabilize things after you've f***ed everything up again like you always do. And you can kill two birds with one stone by stabilizing China and getting rid of Douglas Dietrich, the man who calls you out for the satanic scum that you are. <laughs> That's the uh, offer that I have to have in terms of that. So on that we can close up for now. But yes, that's uh, essentially, uh, I guess the best Great way to Great peace, Douglas. Oh, thank you. It is, uh, it is incredible to watch somebody tie that much stuff together yeah. in that short amount of time. Oh, thank very, you. Very, very exquisite piece of work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir.